Back in June of 2017, classic PlayStation fans rejoiced at the release of the Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy, a complete remake and remastering of the original three games in the series. Critical and commercial reception of this was so strong that a little over a year later, we were granted another remade trilogy of a classic PlayStation mascot in the form of the Spyro Reignited trilogy, which was just about as warmly received, save for a little bit of shakiness in its release, but nothing that would stop someone from enjoying the games. At this point, I was personally hoping that we would get an announcement for a brand new Crash or Spyro game, perhaps headed up by the same developers who had helped make these remakes, since they already seemed to know what they were doing. Instead though, Activision decided to keep the nostalgia train rolling and announced a remake of the original Crash Team Racing, a fantastic kart racer that easily goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Mario Kart series for most players. The remake was being headed up by a developer known as Beanox, who does have a long history of work stretching back almost 20 years, though a majority of what they've made have either been port jobs or licensed games. But that combined with the fact that they were responsible for a few of the later Skylanders games does suggest that they were a pretty good fit for the project. Well, the game was released back in June of 2019, and my girlfriend and I picked it up a few months later in September, as we often do with our games nowadays, and I can say with complete confidence that this is an excellent game made by a consummate developer who really knows what they're doing when it comes to making a fun experience, chained down by an insidious publisher who only cares about how much they can milk the game's audience for. But we'll get to that. I personally don't have much of a history with the original game. I never owned it and only played it a few times at friends' houses, and it didn't really resonate with me the way that Mario Kart had. Thankfully, even coming in with a fresh perspective, the game is still very fun, though it did take me a bit of time to get used to its particular boost mechanic. See, in most kart racers, or at least the more modern ones, getting a boost is dependent on just holding down a drift button and drifting around corners. The longer you hold the drift, the bigger the boost you get. In Nitro Fueled, however, the game has a meter mechanic where when you start drifting and then hit the opposite shoulder button, you'll get a small boost. Get at least three small boosts in a single drift like that, and you can get a larger, more sustained boost for a brief period. And by constantly drifting and boosting, you can actually store up a boost reserve and keep that boost going for insane amounts of time. If you've ever had the pleasure of watching someone who really knows what they're doing at this game, and I'm not one of them, it is a thrill to watch them sustain a constant, consistent boost for entire laps, taking shortcuts that on first glance would seem impossible from the game's design. But there is a risk to constantly boosting. If you try to activate the boost too early or too late, it can fail which wastes one of the small boosts you could get during that drift and basically forces you to stop drifting and try again, since holding down a normal drift for too long will cause you to spin out. If you activate the boost when it's only in the middle of the meter, you'll only get a tiny boost. If you want to get that big sustained boost, then you have to wait until the meter is right near the top, which greatly risks failing the boost. This risk versus reward system is the backbone of the gameplay, as you can go through and learn all the ins and outs of a course, but knowing when to drift and when to activate those boosts and for how long, and learning to handle the trickier corners while sustaining or even cancelling your boost power with the air brake is key to doing well in almost every mode. And speaking of modes, my god this game has a lot of them. Actually this game has a lot of everything. Modes, characters, secrets, it can be downright overwhelming when first starting out. Not only did the developers see fit to include all the characters and tracks from the original game, but they also threw in every track and character from Crash Nitro Kart from the PlayStation 2 as well. And thanks to updates and things like the ongoing Grand Prix events, there's been a steady stream of new characters, carts, cosmetics, and tracks flooding into the game for a while. Some of them even brought in from the black sheep of the series, Crash Tag Team Racing, giving them a chance to be in a much better game for once. The variety on display here is staggering. 
For those who are familiar with the original game, you'll be happy to know that a lot of the original character unlocks and such are pretty much the same here, even up to and including the secret button code to unlock Penta Penguin and unlocking Entropy by beating his ghost in each track in time trial mode. The game also looks great as well, even on the Switch version. That's the version where I got my footage from, and while it does take a hit in fidelity, the characters still look great. And my god, the animation is amazing. Very bouncy and stretchy. Not only do the characters bounce and sway in their carts, but even in the limited cutscenes of the adventure mode, the way that the characters move and emote just fills them all with so much life and personality. Oh, and the adventure mode itself is great. It's not very long, but just riding around in the hubs and talking with the various bosses before racing them is just plain fun. And even playing the game by yourself is a joy. And while the couch multiplayer is fun as well, the online is... Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, time to get into some of the negatives of the game. And don't worry, the core game is immensely fun. But there are some minor negatives that don't ruin the experience, but do hinder it somewhat. And one major one that almost turned me off the game entirely, but again, we'll get to it soon. First, there's the online. I don't know what it's like on the other consoles, but on the Switch version, I haven't been able to get online once since getting the game. It always ends up kicking one player or saying a player left, and then the game terminates. Then it hitches, and I get booted back to the lobby. I know it's not an internet connection problem, I'm on a stable gigabit connection. And from the research I've done, it does seem like there's a small group of players who are having the same issue, while most others aren't. I have no idea what's causing it, but I'm certain it's not a problem on my end. And considering that it's an isolated group having this issue, I'd like to give the devs the benefit of the doubt and say it's not an issue with the game overall. It's annoying, but not a deal breaker. Like I said, there's still plenty to do in the game proper, even on my own. Though getting there sure takes a while. Even with patches that went out months ago to improve the loading speed of the game, I still get load times regularly going over a minute when the game loads anything. The races themselves are quick and snappy and almost never last longer than 5 minutes, but a minute of loading before and after a 3-5 minute race does wear me down now and then, especially when I'm farming Wumpa Coins or Nitro. Not now. We'll get there, believe me. Lastly, I feel like the game's difficulty is not as well balanced as it could be. Easy mode is incredibly easy, at least for me personally, to a boring degree. I'd actually be perfectly okay with that for accessibility purposes if normal mode didn't overcorrect so hard. The leap from easy to normal difficulty is so staggering that I actually had to go back and see if I'd accidentally set the game to hard mode at first, but no, there really is just that big of a difference in the AI. I mean, yeah, I did manage to eventually get better at the game, but I was always feeling tense. Even when it felt like I was doing really well, like I should have outpaced a lot of my opponents, they were still always on my tail, and it felt really weird. To date, I haven't really done much with hard mode, I'm still not sure I'd be able to handle it if there was as big a gap between hard and normal as there is between normal and easy. I don't really think I'll bother, because I kind of know where my skill cap is. Again, none of these are deal breakers. The core gameplay is so good that I'm willing to put up with a long load time or issues with the online. But then there's the shop. Remember before when I said you can get stuff the same way as in the original game, up to and including unlocking a hidden character with a button input cheat code? Well, how do you get everything else that was added into the game afterwards? Well, all the tracks, even the DLC and Grand Prix ones, are added automatically. But for characters, costumes, stickers, paint jobs, vehicles, and flair, you have to buy them in... The Pit Stop. The in-game shop. Now this was already setting off red flags for everyone the moment it was unveiled. While the game didn't have any microtransactions at launch, the setup in this shop was suspiciously close to the shop found in games like Fortnite, where you have a limited selection of items to choose from at any given time, usually one in each category, and several bundles that contain multiple items, usually for a quote, 
discounted cost, though they're still very expensive. You can spend the game's in-game currency, Wumpa Coins, in here, in order to unlock these items, but the store is in a 24-hour rotation. If there's something you want and it's not available at the moment, you either have to wait until the time elapses and something new rotates in, or keep buying things you don't necessarily want to make new items appear. To the game's credit, you can earn Wumpa Coins by doing pretty much anything. Every race, battle, time trial, relic race, ring rally, literally doing anything in this game will get you a small amount of coins. The payout generally isn't that generous though. Considering most things in the shop will cost you around a thousand coins a pop, there are cheaper items of course, but on average, most things are going to cost you 1,000 to 1,500, and most times you'll get around 50 to 80 coins a race, you'll have to do some serious grinding if you want to get everything. Coin payouts are generally based around how long the races last, so longer race tracks or more laps equals a bigger payout, and the payout does double on weekends, but it's still a pretty big grind to get the things you want. But hey, now you can just buy Wumpa Coins and just bypass all that tedious playing the game you already spent money on, yay! Ugh. What makes this even worse is the fact that this was added a few months after the game's release. Most outlets had already put out glowing reviews about the game, and plenty of people had bought it and were still actively playing, which is probably the most wretched, underhanded shit heel move I have ever seen from a publisher during the month that happened. And it's such a shame because everything about the game itself is great. The gameplay, the music, the graphics, Beanox has done an amazing job giving us a game that would have been amazing even if the original game had not existed. But things like this, even at its budget price, it is so hard to justify buying a game if its publisher is going to engage in predatory practices like this. It's even worse when you factor in the Grand Prix events, which are pretty much designed to push you more and more towards buying more coins. During a Grand Prix, you can earn Nitro by completing certain tasks, usually daily and weekly missions that require you to play as a certain character or on a certain track and fulfill a list of tasks. There are also simple challenges each day, like just win a race or complete a time trial, themed races that usually revolve around the theme of the pre, and pro challenges, which are missions that often revolve more around luck than skill, honestly, that give you a ton of nitro if you can make them work. You can also increase the nitro you earn by playing as boosted characters or with cosmetics or vehicles that are boosted. With the right loadout, you can almost double the amount of nitro you get, but that's where it gets sleazy. Most of the time, the things that will give you the biggest boost to your nitro are things that are acquired by gaining nitro. Generally, you can only earn one new character by gathering nitro and the rest of it is cosmetic stuff, costumes and stickers and the like, but there's always a ton of other stuff added in each Grand Prix but almost all of it is only available in the pit stop for Wumpa Coins, and stuff that is introduced during a Grand Prix is locked in a vault after it's over. Yes, they'll bring it back again occasionally, but you won't know when, and until that time, if you didn't purchase it when it was available, it won't even enter into the pit stop's rotation. Hell, you even get 200 free Nitro a day just for visiting the pit stop. And with how expensive the Grand Prix items usually are, some of them go for 2,500 coins or above, it creates a sense of urgency, which can push some players into just caving in and buying coins rather than earning them through normal gameplay. It's gross, is what I'm saying, and as much as I like the core game, this entire system really taints the experience for me. Activision truly has no shame. Well, that's a bit of a downer note to end on, but it's something that has to be said. In the end, this is a great game marred by a publisher's greed. If you were at all interested in the game, and you haven't already bought it, I do think it's fun. But I don't believe in supporting a practice like this. 
The game has since gone down in price significantly and can be had for about $30 to $40 on every major platform at the time of this video. If you're going to get it, just be aware that you are going to be subtly pushed into spending more money than what you spent on the game initially. If that's something that doesn't appeal to you, I'd recommend waiting until the day that the game stops getting new content and Activision stops milking people for all they're worth. That day might never come, mind you, but at least you can rest easy knowing you weren't swindled out of money in exchange for a good that doesn't actually exist and has no real inherent value other than what you as a player project onto it. No, I'm not bitter at all. See you next time, everyone.